Hello, everyone, and welcome to section 2.1, the first section in chapter two in precalculus, quadratic functions. When f of x is equal to a number, we have a constant function. So in case you never made this connection before, when you see something like y is equal to 3, that's because it is constantly 3. So we call it a constant function. Where as soon as something has an x in it, now it has a variable. And the reason it got that name, again, if you never thought about it before, is because it varies. It changes over the course of an equation, whether it be a curve or a line. It, the line varies, where a constant function stays constantly at a number. So f of x is equal to a number is a constant function. When the highest degree of, the, um, of x is 1, we call it a linear function. Um, so if you have y is equal to 3x plus 2, this is assumed to be to the first power. So that is a linear function that's going to make a line. Today, we're going to be studying quadratic functions, which is what we call it when it, the highest degree uh, is 2. The graph of a quadratic function is a parabola. So today, we're going to study quadratic functions in two different forms, and you have to learn them both. They're not, you can't choose one or the other. Um, sometimes you'll be presented with this way, and sometimes you'll be presented with this way, and you just need to know them both. Um, your book, unfortunately, calls this standard form. Uh, I don't know why they do that. I have always called it vertex form, and every other book calls it vertex form. Um, this, in my opinion and in every other book I've ever used, is standard form. I don't really care what the form is. It doesn't matter to me, but I wanted you to know that your book is going to refer to this vertex form as the standard one. Um, it is better, but um, it's not standard. So just a little note there. So it doesn't matter which form you have. If the A in both of them, if that's greater than zero, if it's positive, the parabola is going to open up. If a is less than zero, that is, if it's negative, the parabola is going to open down. If the absolute value of a is a fraction less than one, then the parabola is wider. So it says absolute value because maybe you will have uh, one third x squared, and it would be easy to say, oh, if it's a fraction less than one, but it also could be negative one third, and that would still be wider. It doesn't matter if it's positive or negative. So we say the absolute value is a fraction less than one. And again, the form doesn't matter. All these properties about a hold true for both forms. If a is greater than one, so for example, y is equal to 4x squared, then the parabola is going to be narrower than the parent graph y is equal to x squared. If you say steeper, that's also good. Now this is going to be the first place where there's a change. In this original form, ax squared plus bx plus c, the vertex has to be calculated by doing negative b over 2a. You remember, might remember that from algebra 2. But that only gives you the x-coordinate of the vertex. To find the y-coordinate, you have to plug in negative b over 2a to the equation. So hopefully negative b over 2a is familiar to you, but remember it only gives you the x-coordinate. The correct way to write this would be negative b over 2a and then f of, remember that notation always means plug this number in. So if you want to write it 
in the correct mathematical terms, you'll do it this way. But it's always good to have it on your paper as a little note to yourself. Plug in negative b over 2a to the equation. This is where vertex form really wins. Uh, the vertex is hk. You don't have to do any math at all. The vertex form is honestly far superior. If the parabola opens upward, the vertex is a minimum, which makes sense. Vertex is at the bottom when it's opening up. And again, it doesn't matter which form you have. If the parabola opens downward, the vertex is a maximum in both cases. Okay, next difference. The axis of symmetry is going to be this line that goes down the middle. Remember, all vertical lines have the format x is equal to a number. And since this is the vertex, negative b over 2a comma f of negative b over 2a, what number is x equal to? x is equal to negative b over 2a. It's simpler in this one. Oops, x. x is equal to h. OK, so for the first time, this format wins, what I'm going to call standard form, not what your book calls it. When um, you always find the y-intercept by letting x be equal to 0. But in vertex form, this is the first time that vertex form is actually not superior. When you put a zero in here, there's still a lot of math to do. You're still going to have to square h, multiply it by a, and add k. It's a lot of work. Plug zero in for x. But when you plug zero in for x in the standard form, you plug a zero in there, a zero in there, you're definitely going to get C every time. So this is where um, standard form is superior. Okay, x-intercepts. The x-intercept in standard form can be determined by setting the equation equal to zero and factoring. If it's not factorable, you might have to use the quadratic formula. If the x-intercept is, if the problem is in vertex form, you're still going to set the x-intercept equal to zero, but now you could add, subtract k or add k to both sides, divide by a and square root. We'll actually do a problem. So for these two, see examples. We'll actually practice that, but there's no like little quick way to tell you what it is. Hopefully what you can see on this chart is that the two forms are practically identical. Every answer was practically identical. Um, the biggest difference was really just in the vertex. All right, we're going to do a bunch of examples and hopefully you will get this. Graph each of the following. For each one, we're going to identify the axis of symmetry, the x-intercepts, the y-intercepts, and the vertex. Make sure you always express the intercepts as ordered pairs. So this is in vertex form. We'll start with a fun one. Vertex form is awesome because I can see, remember, it's negative 3. It's the opposite. So there you go. Boom. Negative 3, 1 right there. Um, the parent graph for the parabola, remember, have these ones memorized, 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4, and if you can make it, 3, 9, because y is equal to x squared. Do not plot points for the graph you're given. That's too much work. Make a new origin. and use the parent graph or the parent table. 
So what I do is now that I have my vertex, I could make a table and plug numbers into here. It would be a lot of work. Instead, if I think of this as zero, zero, actually, I don't wanna write it there because I just realized this is going down. So if I think of this as my new zero, zero, then I can plot zero, zero, one, one, two, four. Notice I'm going down instead of up, one, one, two, one, two, three, four, because of this negative here. Go down instead of up. Now, if you've made a good graph, ooh, that came out a little bit pointy. I really don't want it to be pointy. Make sure it's rounded. Um, if you've made a good graph, you might be able to just see the x-intercepts. I can see them. Negative 2, 0, and negative 4, 0. I didn't plot well enough to see the y-intercept, but you can always find the y-intercept by letting x be equal to 0. So y is equal to negative 0 plus 3 squared plus 1 y is equal to, that's 9, negative 9 plus 1, y is equal to negative 8. So if I had kept going, 2, 4, 6, 8, oh, and that's right on track. It looked like it would have actually hit that, right? 2, 4, 6, 8. So you don't have to rely on the graph in order to get the intercepts. So for the x-intercepts, even though we were able to find them graphically, it's possible I could give you this question and just say, find the x-intercepts. You are not going to make the graph just to find the x-intercepts. So to find the x-intercepts, let y be equal to 0. 0 is equal to negative x plus 3 squared plus 1. I'm going to subtract 1 from both sides. I'm going to multiply both sides by negative 1 to get rid of that negative. I'm going to square root both sides. Now be careful. Plus or minus, this is what people miss, is equal to x plus 3. And now I'm going to subtract 3 from both sides. Yes, there's going to be two answers because I have to do the positive 1 minus 3, and I have to do the negative 1 minus 3. Make sure you express your answer as ordered pairs. So you would write it as when x is negative 2, y is 0, and when x is negative 4, y is 0. So this is if you don't see the x-intercepts on the graph. There is a way to do it. Equation for the axis of symmetry, it's always going to be x is equal to, and it's always going to be equal to the x-coordinate of the vertex. So x is equal to negative 3. And I should just label this. This is my fake 0, 0 right here. That's how I made the graph. All right, let's do another one. I'm, I'm picking all little different ones here. So for number two, um, oh, I'm on number three, I had that. Did I miss number two? Oh, no, there it is, it's just behind my little share thing. All right, so this is a funny one because some people look at this and think it's in standard form and some people think it's in vertex form. In standard form, not what your book calls it, but it makes most, most sense. In standard form, you could think of this as y is equal to negative one-third x squared plus zero x plus five. And then you have your a, your b, and your c. If you think of this in vertex form, then this would be y is equal to negative one-third x plus zero squared plus five. So you have to ask yourself, which one's easier for you? Well, for me, vertex form is always easier. So I look at this and I say, oh, it's going to be over 0 and up 5. The vertex is at 0, 5. 
if you had not thought of that, if you automatically assumed it was standard form and thought of B, negative B over 2A still would have given you negative 0 over 2 times negative 1 third, which doesn't even matter, it's complicated, but 0 divided by anything is 0. So you still would have gotten 0 for the vertex. So it doesn't matter, I'm just giving you options. The equation for the axis of symmetry then is x is equal to zero. It's always going to be right in line with the vertex. The y-intercept is when you let x be equal to zero, zero comma something. When I put a zero in there, I get five. You already can see that. The x-intercept, now if this parabola goes up, it's not going to have an x-intercept. But since this parabola is going down, it is going to have an x-intercept. So how do we find the x-intercepts? We let y be equal to 0. 0 is equal to negative 1 third x squared plus 5. I'm going to move this to the other side and make it positive. I'm going to clear my fractions. Always clear your fractions. Multiply both sides by 3, and I get x squared is equal to 15. x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 15. Now think about that. You're not going to graph that exactly. You're, you're actually just going to leave it. Square root of 15 comma 0. Negative square root of 15 comma 0. But I know. You want to know, can I just write plus or minus the square root of 15 comma 0? Yes on your homework, no on a quiz. I, I want you to make sure you understand. I want to know that you understand it's two different points. Sometimes when people write this, they don't really understand. So write them as two separate ones. So what are these two numbers? Well, I know that the square root of 16 is 4, so the square root of 15 is close to 4, but not quite 4. So 1, 2, 3. 4, ne that's the negative square root of 15. 1, 2, 3, 4, not quite 4. And there we go. Okay. It would be nice if you got another point. So I think to myself, when x is 3, you're always trying to ask yourself, what's the best number I could plug in? Obviously, we already did 0. 1's not good, 2's not good, but 3 is awesome. 3 squared is 9. 9 divided by 3 is 3. It's negative, so negative 3 plus 5 is 2. 1, 2, 3, and 2. And it has symmetry, so you don't even have to uh, plug in another point. By doing one point, you get 2. And it gives you a really nice shape. Ah, back to vertex form, everybody's favorite. So vertex form, this vertex, don't forget, opposite of this one, same as this one. So my vertex is at negative 1, negative 3. My equation for my line of symmetry is always going to go right down the vertex. So it's x is equal to negative 1. We find the y-intercept by letting x be equal to 0. y is 2 times 0 plus 1 squared minus 3, because it's going to be something comma 0. It's going up, so I can kind of look like that. y is equal to 2 times, well, 1 squared is just 1 times 2 minus 3. y is equal to negative 1. Don't forget to write it as an ordered pair, 0 comma negative 1 put this backwards, uh, 0 comma negative 1. And now that I have that point, I also have, oops, that's not negative 1. Um, and now that I have that point, I also have this point. Now let's just say you had chosen to make the graph first instead of finding the y-intercept first. That would be okay too, and then that actually would have told you your y-intercept. So I've told you many times that I want you to just do your parent graph, 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4, 3, 9. However, if there's an A there, because A is equal to 2, you're actually going to cross all these out 
and you're going to multiply them by two. The y is twice as big as before. So zero times two is still zero. One times two is two. Eight, four times two is eight. Nine times two is uh, 18, which we're not actually going to be able to graph it that high. But watch how that affects it. If this is my new fake zero, zero, then from here, zero, zero, one, two on both sides, two, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and on the other side. And look at that. I can make this parabola without the intercepts really nicely. And if I had chosen to graph first, I would have seen that the y intercept was zero, negative one. So you have choices. Some people love to make the graph and get as much information as they can. Some people like to fill out A, B, C, D, then make the graph. You have choices. Now, in this case, the graph would not have helped you with the x-intercept. I can see that there's two x-intercepts, but I can't tell what they are graphically. When you can't do it graphically, you have to do it algebraically. Let y be equal to zero. It's just a matter of solving. Add three to both sides. It's not easy. Divide by two. Square root both sides. Don't forget your plus or minus. And then subtract one from both sides. Negative one plus or minus the square root of three over two is equal to x. It's awful, right? And if you rationalize the denominator, the square root of three over two is the square root of three over the square root of two. Rationalizing the denominator, multiply the top and the bottom by the square root of two, gives you the square root of six over two. So if you actually see this in the back of a book, it's probably gonna be the square root of six over a regular two in order to have the denominator to be rationalized. I'm not gonna fit that in my little thing here, so erase that and make more room. Negative one plus the square root of six over two comma zero and negative one minus the square root of six over two comma zero. Can you check those? Yeah, if you have a calculator, you can see if it looks like it comes out to be, you know, zero point something. It's going to be very small. All right. Next one. So we're back to standard form. I can tell a couple things really easily. I know the parabola is going to be going down. I know that A is equal to 1, so I can use my parent graph. I love standard form for the y-intercept. When x is zero, it's gonna be three. So I've got a lot of information already. What I don't like about standard form is that I can't find the vertex easily. In this format, you have to use negative b over two a. So a is negative one. I know I wrote a is one, but a is actually negative one. b is two, c is three. So negative b or opposite of b over two a worked out kind of nice. Negative two over negative two is one. How do you get the y coordinate? You plug it in. So I'm going to do f of one. Now this is actually still a little bit tricky. Sometimes people accidentally do this step wrong because they square that negative. But look back at the original. You're squaring x then doing the negative. Order of operations says square before negative. So this is going to be, oops, this is a 1 at the x. Negative 2 times 1 plus 3. So it's going to be negative 1 plus 2 plus 3, which is going to be 4. So 1, 4. And it's going to be going down. Remember, I already know my y-intercept right away which makes sense because this is going to be my standard graph, 
0.00112439 because A is just one. It's going down, but there's no two in front or one half in front. So I can go from my fake origin here, my fake zero, zero. I can start there and do one, one, and then over two, down one, two, three, four. And since I can fit it, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is where drawing your line of symmetry is easy, because then you can just say this is three in this direction and three in this direction. It saves you some counting. Notice that my parabola is not perfect. Yours doesn't have to be perfect, but make sure it's not V-shaped. Make sure it's U-shaped. The equation for the line of symmetry is always x is equal to, and in this case, it's x is equal to 1. How do we find the x-intercepts? Well, in this case, we graphed first, and we were able to find them. 1, 2, 3, comma, 0, and negative 1, comma, 0. But let's just say the only question on the homework was find the x-intercepts. I know you are not doing all that work. You are not doing negative b over 2a and making a graph just to find the x-intercepts. Remember, whenever you're asked for the x-intercepts, it always means let the y be equal to 0. And whenever you have an x squared equal to 0, factor, factor out first, factor out first. So. I always take whatever's in front of the x squared out. It makes it easier to factor. And then factoring the first times the first makes the first. The last times the last makes the last. So it has to be three and one. The question is just which one's negative? Well, since the inners make three x and the outers make one x, and I'm trying to get a negative 2x, I want this to be negative and this to be positive. How do I make the 3x negative? By putting the negative there. And I can make the 1x positive by putting the positive there. So if I hadn't had the graph, now I could see from here that if x is 3, that would make 0. And if x was negative 1, that would make 0. So you don't have to make the graph to find the x-intercepts. Okay, we have three, uh, no, just one more, last one. So I will just say that when I look at these, this is what I do. I make my ordered pair, I write x is equal to, I write zero comma blank, and I write blank comma zero twice because there's usually two x-intercepts because it usually crosses twice. So this is this is like my little setup. I actually, you can put that on your appendix. Um, if you're in college prep, you can set this all up and then it kind of guides you through it. So for vertex, remember you can stop the video and try this one on your own. Um, so for vertex, I'm going to do negative b over 2a a b c so opposite of b over 2 times a negative 8 over 4 is negative 2. i get the y value by plugging in the negative 2 2 times so now the negative is being squared unlike the one above where x was being squared and then negative this is the actual negative 2 is being squared Negative 2 squared is 4 times 2 is 8, minus 16 plus 7 is negative 1. Negative 2, negative 1. Now I'm going to do the graphing last this time. I'm going to show you you can get all these pieces without graphing. This is always going to be h, so x is equal to negative 2. Didn't graph anything. I can see it just from the h. I find the y-intercept by plugging in 0 for x, which is the fast one. It's going to be 7. And I get the x-intercept by plugging in 0 for y. See, it's already there in the ordered pair. So
So I set it equal to zero and I factor the first times the first makes the first. The only choice is two X and X. And the last times the last is the last. And I love it when there's only one choice. The only choice is one in seven. So it's either got to be one in seven. That would give me inners of X and outers of 14 X, which either makes 13 or 15, but doesn't ever make eight. Or if it's not one in seven, it must be seven in one, which gives me seven X and two X. Uh oh, that doesn't make eight in any way, shape, makes nine or five. So what do we do if we can't factor? If you can't factor, you're going to love this. Are you so excited? Use the quadratic formula. Yay. Use the quadrat quadratic formula. I know you're so excited. You may put the quadratic formula in your appendix. It is x is equal to. So somebody thought of this really cool formula that if you are given 0 is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c, the quadratic formula says x will be equal to the opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. If you had Mrs. McCall for a teacher, I'm pretty sure she has like a little song that goes with it, but sorry, you really don't want to hear me sing. Um, so we're going to do just basic quadratic formula. X is equal to opposite of B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2 times A. Negative 8 plus or minus the square root. This is 8 times 7 is 56. 64 minus 56 is 8 over 4. Okay, I'm going to give you a little piece of advice. The number of people that accidentally do this is way too high. Way too high. So if I were you, I would always break it down into two separate fractions. So if I were you, when you write the quadratic formula, you might actually want to have it as negative b over 2a plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. It is just safer. It's, it's honestly one of the biggest mistakes I see with the quadratic formula. So x is equal to negative 2 plus or minus. And I don't know how much you learned about simplifying radicals, but the square root of 8 can be broken down into the square root of 4, which is something I can do, and the square root of 2, which I can't. But you always want to break a radical down into a part you can do and a part you can't, so that the part you can do, you simplify. So this is actually 2 square roots of 2 over 4, which now you can write. Now these two do cancel. They're both on the outside. You couldn't cancel the 8 with the 4 because the 8 is stuck in the radical. But now that you've taken part of that out, you can do this. And if you're thinking, golly, that was a ton of work for the x-intercepts, you don't need it to make the graph. You only need this if I ask you what the x-intercepts are. So negative 2 plus the square root of 2 over 2. Negative 2 minus the square root of 2 over 2. Those are the x-intercepts. Do I need it to make the graph? I do not. Negative 2, negative 1. Axis of symmetry at negative 2. Y intercept at 0, 7, which means there's also a point over there by symmetry. A is 2. So when I go to make my parent table, 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4, 3, 9, I'm going to have to cross them all off because the Y is twice what you would think it would be. So times two. Zero times two is still zero. One times two is two. Four times two is eight. Nine times two is 18, but we're not gonna be able to make it that high. 
So look what that does then. If this is my new fake zero, zero, obviously the real one is right there. Wait, we're not going to use that one. Um, so my first point is from here, one, two, one, two, and the other side. My next point is two, eight. I already have that one. Did it when I did my y-intercept. If I had made the graph first, I would have found the y-intercept. Since I found the y-intercept first, it helps me make the graph. Either order you do it and it's going to be good. This is a lot. You guys are doing great. That's it for graphing. Five examples on vertex, axis of symmetry, y-intercept, x-intercept. I hope you can do your homework now. So in my opinion, parabolas of the form f of x is equal to a times x minus h squared plus k, vertex form by every other book, are easier to graph than parabolas in standard form. So we're going to learn how to change them. Now, I'm going to tell you right now that I taught this for 10 years before some kid said, can I just do it this way? And that kid was so right. So there is a little bit of a cheater way to do it. The cheater way, and I'm fine with this, the cheater way is to find the vertex and then change the form, literally. So if the vertex for this one is negative B over 2A, so negative 6 over 2 times 1 is negative 3. Now you have to plug 3 in. f of negative 3 is negative 3 squared plus 6 times negative 3 plus 1, which is 9, minus 18 plus 1. So negative 9 plus 1 is negative 8. So now my vertex is negative 3, negative 8. So I can rewrite number one as y is equal to x plus three squared minus eight. This uses everything that you already know. It was in standard form. Now it's in vertex form. How do I know that? Because I found the vertex. So what way did I teach for 10 years? And I'm going to continue to teach because I think it's faster. Um, and this method I'm about to show you is called completing the square. Not only is it faster, but you do actually have to learn it for higher level math. Pre-calculus is the end of the line for you. You are probably good to go um, unless pre-calculus covers conics, which uh, this year we might not actually get to because of the hybrid schedule. It would be the one thing we would eliminate. Um, but if we do conics, you will eventually have to learn completing the square. But this is how you complete the square. To complete the square, um, you rewrite the function in vertex form, and you literally take this number, whatever b is, and you cut it in half. There you go. That's going to work every single time. And then you say to yourself, oh, that would actually produce, like if you were actually multiplied out, x plus 3 times x plus 3, you wouldn't actually do this out. X, Q, x squared plus 6x plus 9, right? But you don't have a plus 9. You only have a plus 1. So you say to yourself, this produces a plus 9. So to keep it equal, I'm also going to have to figure it out with a minus 9. So 1 minus 9 means the number that goes on the end is the negative 8. And at least 3 quarters of you are going, yeah, I'm totally just going to find the vertex. She lost me on that. But that's because I was trying to explain to you why it works. If you're actually just doing the problem, then here's, this, here's the quick steps. I cut this number in half. I write 
the square of it above, so three squared is nine, and then I tack on the end the opposite. So since I three squared makes positive nine, I take this last number and I subtract nine and I get minus eight. If you understand it, it's a much faster method than doing negative b over 2a, then plugging in the b to find the number. So I'm going to do my next one with the shortcut. f of x is equal to, I cut this number in half, negative 2 squared, it doesn't matter if it's negative or positive, when you square a number it's always going to come out positive, is positive 4. So I always take the last number and do the opposite. So if it was a positive 4, now it's going to be minus 4, minus 10. Boom. Come on, that was pretty fast. Okay. Cut the b in half. When you square the number that you get, negative 2 squared is 4, you take the opposite and you put it with the last number, minus 10. Um, it's, a tr it's a trick. It has value if you understand why it works. But um, I will take either method. I just want the answer. So that's how you would get parabolas from this form into this form, either way. Now, it does get a lot more complicated if there's a number in front of, in front of the A. I will just tell you right now, when, when there is a number in the front, I do not bother to use the, the little method I taught you. It only works when A is equal to one, where you can just cut it in half and then add that extra number to the end. As soon as you get something more complicated, it doesn't work easily anymore. So now I would do it by doing negative B over two A. So this is the same one we actually just did a few minutes ago. Negative eight over four is negative 2. So there's my h. And now f of negative 2 is 2 times negative 2 squared plus 8 times negative 2 plus 7. f of negative 2 is equal to, this is negative 16 plus 7, negative, uh, positive 8, so negative 1. And that's my K, H and K. So what you need to know about this one is that you found H and K. Remember, it's plus two because it's always opposite. But you do have to remember to bring the A. Use the same A. Do you remember that from the very beginning of the lesson? That it doesn't matter which form you use, A is always the same. So if A is two here, A is two in this form also. Don't forget your little square there. Okay, last one. See if you can do it on your own. Pause the video, look at the answer. But I will do it out. I'm going to write it as f of x is equal to negative x minus something squared plus a number at the end. What is that number? We need to find h and we need to find k. So um, negative b over 2a gives me negative 6 over 2 times negative 1. Negative 6 over negative 2 is 3. f of 3, negative 3 squared plus 6 times 3 minus 8. This negative is not in parentheses. It's out in front. So you square the x and then negative by order of operations negative 9 plus 18 minus 8 is 1. And that goes here. So if you did that on your own, great job. Okay, we have a few word problems left to do. So this is for your book, they mean vertex form. 
Okay, let's be clear. When you guys take a quiz or a test, I will never ask you for a specific form. For me, any form is okay. Unless I'm specifically saying, I want to see if you can make it from one form to another form, then you have to do a specific form. But if it just says write an equation in a certain form, you, you pick the form that works for you. But everybody's going to pick this vertex form because it's easier. Y is equal to A times X minus H squared plus K. If you start by writing the formula, it's just going to be easier to fill in. Start by writing the formula, then fill in. So what do I know? I know that the vertex is 1 and 2. I also know it passes through the point 0, 0. So I'm going to use that, use the 0, 0 to work backwards and find A. Because that's the only part of this you don't know. You just need to know A. So we're going to plug in the 0, 0 to work backwards to find A. So I plug a 0 is equal to A times 0. 0 is equal to, so negative 1 squared is 1 times A is just A. Be really careful here that you don't, do negative 1 squared, add 2, and then multiply by a. The only thing being multiplied by a is this part goes with the a, not the 2. So a is equal to negative 2. And now I can put that in my final answer. y is equal to negative 2 times x minus 1 squared plus 2. That's how you would find a. So again, your book said write the standard form. They, they consider this the standard form. I'm so sorry about that, but every other book in the world would call this vertex form, which makes sense. You can see the vertex. You might want to try this next one on your own because it does the exact same thing, but I will do it out for you. Y is equal to A times x minus h squared plus k. First step, write the blank formula. Second step, fill in the vertex. Third step, plug in the point that you know to find a. Where do you have to watch out? Biggest, I'm always going to tell you the biggest mistake. Negative 2 squared minus 1. This is just 4a minus 1. Biggest error is right there. People all the time write 3a, but it's not. Um, that gives me uh, 3. I'm just going to rewrite it. So 4 is equal to 4a, and a is equal to 1. It is also unfortunate that if you make that mistake, you'll still get the same answer on this particular problem. And the final answer then is y is equal to 1 times x minus 4 squared minus 1. So on this problem, if you forgot a completely, like you didn't do any of this math and you still got, you just left it blank, you would have, by, by default, it would have been 1. But I'm not giving you credit for that. I want to see that you knew how to get it. Find, number three, find two quadratic functions, one that opens upward and one that opens downward, whose graphs have x-intercepts 4 and 8. So that means that if 4 and 8 are x-intercepts, that means that when it's in factored form, it must look like this. Does that make sense? Because if x was 4, that would make y equal to 0. Is mine, is mine going up or downward? It's going up because I didn't put anything out in front. 
So this is an acceptable form. You can, you can multiply it out. x squared, inners and outers, make negative 12x plus 32. But this is not necessary. Okay, so just a little bit of extra work. But this one is going up. Now for the downward, this is a little trickier. If you didn't multiply it out, you can put a negative in front. And now this is going down. And this is a good answer. If I actually made it more complicated and said, I want it to be going down and I want it to be steep, you could put a number in front if you wanted to. Not necessary, but I mean, if I asked you for it to be steep. But if you've already multiplied it out, and then you say, oh, I need one going down, and you just put the negative there, that would be wrong. Okay? You would have to put the negative around the entire thing in order for it to suddenly be going down. Otherwise, it wouldn't have the same x-intercepts. When you try and factor this, you're no longer going to get x minus 4 and x minus 8. Okay? So you can't put the negative out front, out front, if you already multiplied it out. Okay. So this is a big mistake that people make. They think they're doing something nice, so like, oh, I'll multiply it out, but then they just stick a negative in front and then it's wrong. Okay. Uh, you don't have to multiply it out. Just leave it like that. Find the x-intercepts. So this is what I was explaining when we were doing graphing. The only thing you need to know about x-intercepts is set the equation equal to zero. If you're lucky, you'll be able to factor it. If you can't factor it, you have to use quadratic formula. So whenever you see find the x-intercepts, this is the kind of thing you'd want to write in your appendix. Set it equal to zero and factor. or use quadratic, okay? Let's see if we can factor it. The only choice for the first times the first is two x and x. And luckily, the only choice for the last times the last is three and one. The question is, which way does it go? If we do it this way, we get three x, and 2x, you might be thinking, oh good, it makes 5x if they're both positive. But if they're both positive, you won't get the last times the last to make the last. Five is always a tricky one because um, people see the two and the three and they think it makes five, but you actually want the three over there, then the inners are x and the outers are six x. And that will also make 5x if the 6 is positive and the x is negative. So positive, negative. What does this mean for solving? It means either the 2x minus 1 is equal to 0 or the x plus 3 is equal to 0. Something is causing the answer to be 0. This one is easy. You can do it in your head. And this one you might be able to do in your head. Add one to both sides, divide by two. But remember, your answers must be ordered pairs. If you stop there, you will lose the last point after working so hard. X-intercepts are ordered pairs. Oops. Hmm. Just wanted to erase these little extra lines. Okay. A baseball is hit at a point three feet above the ground, which might sound weird at first, but if you have somebody that's actually hitting this baseball, this is a really bad drawing. I'm gonna erase it before you screenshot it. it think about where he's hitting it. He's gonna hit it at about three feet. He doesn't, it doesn't, the baseball doesn't start at zero. It starts out at about three, three feet up in the air, depending on how tall he is. And then, so the baseball comes in and he hits it, and he's going to hit it at a 45 degree angle and it's going to go like that. 
So the path of this baseball is given by this function, which is a downward parabola. We know that it crosses at three and it's really shallow. I mean, it's going down, but it's barely a parabola at all. So X is how far it is from where he was standing at home plate. And Y is the height of the baseball in the air. What is the maximum height reached by the baseball? So if we illustrate it a little higher, then it's easier to see that it's a max, but it's a very, very, very subtle parabola. All those words, they just want to know the y coordinate of the vertex. What is the maximum height reached by the baseball? It is the y coordinate of the vertex. So when you're doing a word problem, don't freak out. Just ask your, just read it, draw a picture if you have to, and think to yourself, what am I trying to find? So as it goes further away, the ball goes up in distance and then down because of the negative. You're just trying to find the y coordinate of the vertex. So the x coordinate can be found using negative b over 2a, which is going to be negative 1 over 2 times negative 0 0.0032. All right, let's switch to our graphing calculator so I can show you how to finish that. So first I want to show you how to get the negative b over 2a on your calculator. The alpha button followed by f1, alpha f1, is going to make a fraction for you. And that's really great for doing negative b, so negative 1. Be careful that you use the negative key that's next to the enter and not the subtract button when you're just doing it for a single number. You have to save the other one for subtract. Over 2 times a. So again, negative 0 0.0032. So I've done negative b over 2a, and it gives me the exact answer. Now, this wasn't a very complicated answer, but I'm going to also show you something else cool. This store button right above on, I'm going to say, let's store that answer as x. Now my calculator thinks that's x. Don't worry, it will not screw up future problems. But now, when I want to do the function, I can just actually type in the exact function. Negative 0 0.0032x squared. It thinks that x is 156.25. So I don't have to type in 156.25 squared plus x. I don't have to type in again 156.25 plus 3. It's just going to give it to me. And that is the answer. The y, the y coordinate of the vertex is 81.125, which means that the ball, when it was 156 feet away from home plate, was 81 feet in the air. Now, somebody in the class is very cleverly thinking, oh, I'll just type the equation. I didn't have to do any of that. I could have just typed the equation into my graphing calculator and then found the maximum. I love that. I love that you're thinking that way. That is a really great thing to do. Here's why people struggle with that. Because they hit graph. Like, oh, I can't see the maximum. Remember, from doing the problem, we know that the maximum doesn't happen. If this is our little, our little guy right here hitting the baseball and it goes up in the air, that is not going to hit home plate until it's 156 feet away and it's going to go 81 feet in the air. How high does your little window go? Your window only goes to 10 in both directions. So people struggle to use their graphing calculator unless they have a sense of the window. Now, we already know the answer, which is kind of a cheater. But if you really had no idea, you could sit there and just say, well, it could happen in as many as 100 feet away. Turns out it's more. But I'm going to pretend like I don't know that. And how high do I think the ball could go? I don't know. Maybe the ball can go 50 feet in the air. I hit graph. Okay, so I still have some stat plots on. If that ever happens to you, just go to second stat plot and then 
turn them off. It's very easy to turn them off and then you don't have to worry about them anymore. Okay. So going back to my graph and see, I still can't see it. So when that happens to me, I just make a huge window. I'm like, all right, let's go out to 500 and let's go up to 200. I want to make sure I can see it. I don't have time to slowly increment my, oh, there it is. So the window is everything. So some people would rather do negative B over 2A than try to make the correct window. But here's the little guy standing there. He hits the baseball up in the air. And it's actually not, not that steep. It's because of the scale that I've used. But here's our max min feature, which we learned in a different section in chapter one. So second calculate, I want to find the maximum. Now look where it's starting me, way over there. I don't want to be there. I know it's between zero and what did I make my scale? Up to 500, I think. I know it's between zero and 500. Do I want to make a guess? Nope. There it is. So at a hunt, so when the ball is 156 0.2 feet away from home plate, it is 81 feet in the air. So you are welcome to do this problem on your calculator, but you'll have to adjust your window. Okay, so we have just two left. Are you ready? You're going to be able to hang in there? Almost done. All right, so second to last one. A small local soft drink manufacturer has a daily production cost given by the equation C where C is the total cost in dollars and X is the number of units produced. How many units, so what is X, should be produced each day to minimize the cost? So this cost equation, they wrote it this way, but let's write it as cost is equal to 0 0.075 X squared. I really like it in descending order. Minus 120 X uh, plus 70,000 is some kind of upward parabola that starts way up here at 70,000. So even if they make zero units, this is the number of units, and this is the cost. Even if they make zero units, it's costing $70,000. You might be thinking, how is that even possible? Because they still have startup costs they had to rent the space and get the electricity turned on and get all the equipment and hire all the people. They've already spent a lot of money and they haven't even produced anything yet. So as soon as they start to produce things, the cost goes down because now everything that they're, they're making, they can sell. So they want to make a lot of units. So why would the cost ever start to go back up? Well, at some point you make too many units now you have to pay people overtime or open a second facility or buy another piece of equipment. So there's some kind of a sweet spot there where you've kept your cost to an absolute minimum. Is this important in the business world? This is huge. So this is a really important to me that you understand that these aren't just math. Somebody is out there in the real world doing the math. And that's the difference between the companies that are making a lot of money and the companies that are not is whether or not they're doing this math. So anyway, they want to know the number of units. What part is that of the vertex? It is the X part of the vertex, X number of units for C, which is great. We can do negative B over 2A. So positive, it's the opposite of B, positive 120 over 2 times 0 0.75. Again, you might use that new feature on your calculator that makes the fraction for you. And it is 120 divided by 2 times 0.75, 80. 80 units. Oh, I must have missed something. 120, oh, 0.075, there you go, 0.075. So it is 800, I was gonna say, there can't just be 80 uh, units that they're making. No, they're making 800 units. This time I don't need to plug it back in and find the Y coordinate. That would be if they said, what is the cost? 
of making 800, but they didn't. They just said how many units. So it's important that you know which one you're looking for, the X or the Y. Last one. The total revenue earned per day in dollars from a pet sitting service is given by this equation. It's a negative parabola. And it actually goes through zero. I don't know if you can tell, but if P is zero, then the revenue is zero. Where P is the price per pet. So if they don't charge anything, they're not going to make any money. And then there's a certain sweet spot where they're charging a certain price and maximizing their revenue. But then it starts to go back down. Maybe they're charging a little too much. And so their revenue goes down because they don't get as many sales. So again, very real world application. They do it with phones. How much can I charge for this phone and have people keep buying, keep buying, keep buying? Eventually, if they charge too much, the, the revenue is going to go down. They're not going to make as much. Um, if this is interesting to you, go into some kind of business field when you, when you graduate. So the revenue, if the price paid is four, so these are literally just plugging it in. A lot of times the word problems in pre-calculus are not hard. It's just you need to know what you're doing, where you're plugging things in. So I'll let you go. I'm just going to do it on my calculator. So you can put four into your calculator and you should get 408 for the first one. 468 when R is six and 432 when r is 8. And you might be thinking, hold on, I plugged in a bigger number, but I got a smaller number. Yeah, so 8 must be on the, on the downturn. They must have charged too much. $8 was just too much per pet, and so their revenue actually started to decrease. So what is that sweet spot? What is that price that's going to yield a maximum revenue? They're looking for the vertex. So negative B over 2A gives me 6.25. But don't just write that. It's it's $6.25 per pet. So make sure you list it as that's the price. And what is the revenue? Now you're going back and doing what you did before. The revenue for charging $6.25, if you plug that into the original equation, will give you 468.75. Now on the outside chance, outside chance, on the very likely chance that you did not actually plug any of this in, you didn't even get your graphing calculator off of your desk, you just let me do all the math, um, you probably should just do one of them and make sure that you know how to type it into your graphing calculator. All right, you survived. This was a very long section. Bad news, 2.2 is also long. Um, but then the rest of the chapter is pretty reasonable. So have a great rest of your day.